All right, welcome everybody. We have uh, Metropolitan Jonah joins me again today. And uh, this week we've had a couple of guests, actually one more guest coming. Uh, uh, Jim Jatras and I discussed the history of uh, the church under uh, communist persecution, the Soviet era, KGB, uh, Roe Corps and all that. But today we have Metropolitan Jonah is gonna join us. His eminence is going to discuss maybe the history of the uh, church uh, under persecution, the, the Russian church. Um, I know a lot of people in the West, especially the younger crowd that that kind of follows a lot of what we do, they may not be too up to speed on the Cold War, and they probably have heard about communism and, and persecution and this kind of stuff, but um, where do you think would be the best place to start, Metropolitan Jonah? This is, I think you have a, a published work on this, so what what do we need to know about the Russian church and, and communism? Well, I think basically you need to start back in 1917. Um, uh, which was actually started out as a time of great hope for the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, uh, there was a, a great council of the church uh, that brought together all many, many uh, bishops and lay people from all over. Um, of course, it was a time of political turmoil. Uh, the emperor, uh, Tsar Nicholas II, had been forced to uh, uh, abdicate in March of 1917. Uh, the council began to meet soon after, and it began to enact some rather um, extensive reforms uh, to the church to try and bring it out of the, uh, uh, it had been a period of uh, uh, difficult relations with the state under the, uh, actually since Peter the Great. Um, and so uh, they restored the patriarchate and they made some uh, necessary steps towards uh, towards some uh, reforms and especially um, began to include lay people and clergy, lower clergy in, uh, in the decision-making process, um, which was something pretty unique. Um, and so uh, there, were, and there were other things that were considered as well, but it was a period of great, uh, uh, great hope and great um, uh, amount of progress uh, for the church as it as it came into the 21st or the 20th century. Um, uh, at the same time as that was going on in Moscow, uh, in St. Petersburg, you had Lenin and, uh, and his minions who were uh, organizing and in, 19, and in October there was the, uh, the coup, which basically uh, overthrew the provisional government and uh, established uh, uh, Lenin and, and, and company took over and the Russian civil war began. Um, however, the, uh, the murder of, of churchmen began almost immediately. Um, and it, actually, a couple of the first martyrs of the church um, uh, were two priests who had served in America, um, Father uh, John Kachurov and, uh, or, um, or was it John Kuchur? Uh, and um, Alexander Hudovitsky. One had built the cathedral in Chicago and the other had built the cathedral in New York. Um, and St. Tikhon, who had been, uh, who was elected patriarch in 1917, um, had been the uh, bishop of San Francisco and then of New York. Um, and so there was a very big, you know, great tie um, between the leadership in the Russian church and uh, the American uh, mission. Um, even though the American mission was very small, uh, relatively speaking. Um, but uh, at that time, the, uh, uh, Lenin almost immediately uh, nationalized all the property of the church, uh, confiscated it, uh, closed churches, uh, began to shoot clergymen. Um, and, uh, and this is something that uh, escalated over the course of the years. Um, uh, the Civil War was a period of, of, of bitter chaos uh, in Russia. Uh, nobody had thought that... Uh, anything like that could ever happen in Russia. Um, and so those who could afford to leave, uh, many did. Um, and uh, there were, uh, and people got out any way they could. Many, uh, many went to the South into, into Ukraine, which had declared autonomy or um, independence from, from Russia um, and, but, but that was soon taken over by the Soviets. Others fled into Finland, 
And there were, some, there were actually many who fled across Siberia, um, some even by foot into China, um, you know, literally thousands of miles. Wow. Um, and so it was, uh, and, and they all expected that they would go back within a year or two once, mm. once this communist thing um, uh, worked itself out. Of course, it took 70 years, which is what, three generations. Um, and uh, uh, among those people were uh, clergy. Um, uh, there were, of course, many clergy who uh, chose to stay and, uh, and bear witness uh, uh, with their suffering and with their lives. Uh, but there were also many who chose to, uh, to leave and, and uh, minister to their flocks who themselves were going into exile. Um, at this time, there, was all, there were also uh, three major uh, dioceses uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church that were outside of Russia. Uh, there was Western Europe, there was North America, and there was Eastern Asia. Um, uh, the Russian Church had significant missions in each places, significant numbers of churches and, and faithful, and of course, uh, the number of faithful in these places uh, grew exponentially um, as uh, people fled the Civil War. Um, and uh, so during this time, the, uh, uh, in 1922, uh, Patriarch Tikhon put out an ukaz, which is a um, declaration that all of the external dioceses of the Russian church should organize their own lives until contact with the mother church, with the patriarchate itself, could be reestablished because uh, with the chaos of the Soviet regime um, uh, and the Civil War, nothing was, was possible. Um, uh, so in uh, uh, the, the group of, the group, group of uh, bishops who, uh, who fled came together first in Constantinople, uh, then eventually they made their way to Serbia. Um, of course, Serbia, uh, Serbia at that time was, uh, uh, was a free country. It was not under, under the communists. That didn't happen until after the Second World War. Um, and they were able to organize themselves into uh, a higher church administration. Um, but also the uh, bishops from, um, from these other dioceses, from Western Europe, from North America, and from uh, Eastern Asia, took part in the uh, organization of this new higher church administration of the Russian church outside of Russia, um, which later became called the Synod of Bishops of the Russian church outside of Russia. Um, and so uh, uh, basically uh, the Russian church then had two administrations, the, one, the administration of the patriarchate inside the inside of the Soviet Union and, and the administration for the Russians outside the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it was a, uh, uh, many of the bishops um, and, and reflecting many of the faithful um, were, uh, were very uh, staunch monarchists. Um, of course, they were bitterly anti-communist. Um, they just had their whole lives confiscated and, you know, and friends and family shot um, and uh, everything they'd known destroyed by the communists. Um, and so they, uh, they, they held on to their traditional view, um, uh, which was the normal Russian um, orientation. There, uh, there had been some, there had been some, uh, discussion of movement towards a constitutional monarchy before the revolution. Um, uh, but uh, because the monarchy under, under the Romanovs was an autocracy, um, which means that um, all power uh, rested in the czar. Um, uh, Nicholas was willing to, uh, to consider a, a more democratic alternative to that. Uh, probably based on the British model. Uh, of course, um, uh, they were very closely uh, related to the, uh, 
to Queen Victoria. And uh, um, so that would have been nothing unusual. Um, but uh, when, when Nicholas uh, abdicated, uh, he abdicated uh, for himself and his son. He gave it to his brother. His brother didn't want it. And so his brother abdicated and that ended the monarchy in Russia. Um, so, so that's kind of a, <clears throat> that's, that's the situation where uh, setting up things in this, this time between the First and the Second World War. Um, uh, eventually, of course, the Bolsheviks uh, won, the, won the Russian Civil War and banished, um, uh, well, they were executed um, uh, the, the White Army, as it was called, um, and, uh, and, they, and they subjected all of the, uh, the people of Russia uh, to, their, to their will. Um, among these things were collectivization, um, where the, uh, 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 the peasants who had been freed 50 years before um, were forced to uh, abandon their, their villages and move into the cities, or they were forced to move into collective farms. Um, and there was a particular um, uh, persecution against the kulaks, who were the peasants who had, had been very successful. Um, and they, uh, they'd uh, begun to own land and, and, you know, and build their own businesses, build their own farms, and you know, generally were, uh, were, were pretty well off. Um, uh, the, you know, ba the basic uh, ethos of communism, um, is, it, it's all built on resentment and, and, and envy. And uh, so, uh, the communists were, who were basically uh, uh, the alienated class uh, tried to seize all of the assets of the um, of, of the people who who had resources. And there were some very wealthy uh, aristocracy in Russia, um, but they didn't they didn't strictly go with the aristocracy. They uh, uh, to or confiscate their resources. Um, they basically also went for the simple people. So the people who were living, who had maybe a, a, a six bedroom house or something like that, would be forced to take in two or three other families. And of course, they, they had no ownership of their house. Um, they, they had um, committees who, were, who, who um, uh, distributed housing to people um, because all of a sudden the state owned everything. Um, and so uh, a family might remain in the house that they had owned, but they would only have two rooms, for example. Um, it was, it, it was, a, it was a, a, a massive um, reduction in, in the way of life of, of the Russian people. Um, Let me ask you a question about the, during this period, uh, is this, is there a big difference between the different provisional governments and, and revolutionaries that come to be? I mean, there, you've got Bolsheviks, you've got Mensheviks, you've got Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin. Um, what's your analysis of these, these different phases of these different characters? Because they seem to take on different attitudes and some a little more vicious than the others towards the church. Well, at least. <clears throat> Well, there was a there was a huge push um, uh, in Russia to make Lenin kind of uh, the ultimate good guy. That um, he was he was glorified. He was uh, you know he he, he was uh, pictured by the party that he could do no wrong. Of course, you know the uh, the czar and everybody else were you know uh, painted as as abs abjectly evil. Uh, but uh, the reality is, is that Lenin was a, um, was a butcher. Um, and uh, he had absolutely no regard for, for human life. Um, uh, and the only thing that mattered to him was power. Um, now, uh, Tr Trotsky was his right-hand man. Um, but Tr he and Trotsky disagreed, and I forget about the details, and eventually Trotsky... Um, uh, 
uh, went into exile, I think, uh, with the ascendancy of Stalin. Um, but it, uh, there, there was an initial um, period in Russia in, or in, um, after the Civil War, uh, so starting about 1922. Um, and this was told to me by my spiritual father, who's the um, abbot of Volan. Um, this is a Russian perspective on things. Um, uh, that when the, when the Bolsheviks first took over, um, it was a period of internationalism. Mm. Now you can also translate that globalism if you want, um, but it, and it's basically the same thing. Um, but it was a period in which uh, there was a kind of a, a, a radical uh, destruction of and attempt to destroy the entire culture. First and foremost was the destruction of the family. Um, uh, children were taken and made wards of the state. Uh, women, the, uh, the actual Bolshevik goal for women, whereas on one hand, women, certain women were able to achieve great uh, feats of equality and become physicians and lawyers and, you know, and rise in the party. <clears throat> It was also their doctrine that women should be essentially kept in a stable um, for men to use at their whim and choice. And of course, the children belong to the state and therefore uh, should be raised entirely by the state and therefore the, fa and the family, of course, completely um, destroyed. Um, of course, that also went along with the destruction of religion. Um, the churches were closed, the, uh, all of the sacred items, um, uh, everything of value in the church uh, was confiscated um, and uh, the real estate was taken and uh, the churches were turned into movie theaters, ice rinks, um, uh, storage houses, um, houses of prostitution, um, one church in particular on Red Square was taken and the altar of it was turned into a public toilet. Um, others were, were simply blown up. Um, and so there was, uh, this was a period of the, uh, uh, where the state, you know, was, was, had this massive persecution and uh, both, both the clergy and the laity stood against it and were murdered by the thousands. Um, the Russian church has a, uh, uh, in Moscow, St. Tikhon University, um, which is, uh, uh, I've had a lot of personal contact with. Um, and uh, they, one of their projects was to collect all of the, or as much of the uh, information on the new clergy martyrs. Um, and so they got all of the records uh, from the KGB, um, the trial, transcripts of the trials, the transcripts of the records of, of their execution for 200,000 clergy. Wow. Yeah, and that's just the ones that they had the records for. Mm. Um, uh, Is that for the whole uh, period or just within the first few years of the revolution? Well, you know, most of, most of the, uh, uh, that was basically the, the period from 1922 to about 1940. Four. Oh wow! Um, okay. Um, or forty-two. Really, with World War II, um, they had other things to do than kill their own uh, people. Then, um, and in nineteen forty-four, Stalin um, actually lessened the uh, his the persecution of the church. In fact, he opened up thousands of churches and uh, uh, let the church live a fairly normal as far as possible life. Um, and then uh, Khrushchev closed it down again. Mm -hmm. And that lasted until 1988. So there was another, there was more persecution in the, in the uh, 50s, 60s, through the 80s, but it was more psychological um, torture and, uh, uh, and sending to the gulag rather than outright murder. So uh, was that, in your view, uh, like a pr pragmatic approach on the part of Stalin that, that the 
previous policies he just thought they weren't working or do you think he was kind of a mixed character who had multiple motivations or or we don't know well think the, one of the things about stalin and this is going back to this this first period of uh, of communism under uh under the bolsheviks um uh who had and who they were to a great extent was jews who had been profoundly alienated uh, from their own culture, from their own religion. Of course, the first uh, precept of, of communism is hatred of God. Um, and, so, uh, and so the Russian people, uh, to a great degree, saw, saw the Bolshevik uh, coup as a takeover by the Jews. In other words, they saw it as a foreign power coming and taking over their country. And then imposing all of these things which were fundamentally contrary to Russian culture, which values family, which values religion, which values um, marriage, which values women, which values the church, which, you know, all of these things. Um, and so there was a, a nationalist reaction. Um, even though Stalin himself was, was a Georgian and had been a seminarian, um, uh, uh, who'd, he'd gotten himself thrown out of seminary, rather uh, because of his personality, of course, but um, uh, it, you know, there was, a, there was a very bitter reaction, even within the Communist Party, against the, uh, uh, the uh, internationalists. And, uh, and so this is what led to that massive person, uh, purge of the Jews um, from the Communist Party um, in the 30s. Um, Does this relate to the uh, founding of the state of Israel? And, and this is where Stalin actually, didn't he take a turn and decide that Jews needed to leave? And that was due to the fact that Israel had been founded and, and instead of siding with communists, the Isra Israel ended up siding with the West. Is that, is that correct? I think you're about t 10 years early. Okay. Yeah, this, the, pur the, pur <clears throat> the purge of the Jews, I believe, was in the third, early 30s. Um, then in 1937, there was another massive purge of Christians. Um, and, uh, is this, is this uh, under Stalin? Un, and under Stalin. Okay. Um, and then, uh, then during World War II, of course, uh, the Russians uh, suffered very greatly under, in World War II. Um, uh, they were, of course, during the First World War, they had, the Germans had, had, had taken much of, uh, had taken much of Russia and, and they were pushed back. Uh, then in the Second World War, um, the Germans were not only at the gates of Moscow and, Saint, and, and had um, this massive blockade of St. Petersburg, uh, but they got all the way to the Volga. Um, Stalingrad now is, is Volgograd now, I believe. And it's on the Volga River, which is way, way to the east of Moscow. Um, and uh, uh, so it looked very much like Russia was going to fall um, to, the, to the Nazis. Um, and, part of, and part of that was that uh, the Nazis um, uh, went through and, and opened up churches. They, uh, they had, uh, they had uh, priests from the Russian Orthodox Church in the West, uh, come and following the um, victorious troops of the Third Reich, uh, go into um, Western Russia and reopen churches. There's a there's an uh, an interesting movie on Netflix called Pope or Priest, um, which is about this. Uh, it's called the Pskov, this program of the Nazi regime called the Pskov Mission. Um, and uh, uh, I had the chance to get to know a bunch of those priests oh, wow. who ended up in, uh, in California. Okay. Most of them were, La many of them were Latvians. Um, but uh, that, uh, uh, in, in, of course, Stalin was aware of, of that, even though it was in uh, German occupied territory. And so he came to the conclusion that um, 
in order to rally the population uh, to stand up against the Germans, he had to uh, uh, capitulate on the church um, and Christianity. So Stalin, <clears throat> so Stalin, um, uh, he he pulled he pulled bishops out of the gulag, and they elected a patriarch. Um, he pulled uh, priests and 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 monks and nuns out of the gulag, and they and they reopened monasteries all over and people flocked to the church. And then Stalin even had um, uh, miraculous icons. The, the yes, this, I wanted to ask you about this because this is a lot of people bring this up and uh, I realized I was thinking of the, so the, the founding of the state of Israel is in 47 and there's another, there's a situation that relates to, um, is there a second period where Stalin doesn't allow Jews or is it just that 30s period? Do you know? Well, th well, there were still plenty of Jews. Okay. But but the one but the um, a lot of the a lot of the uh, it was a lot of the um, uh, the internationalist group, yeah. um, including including Trotsky. Um, oh, okay. Who were who were assassinated um, in, in that Mexico. in the Great Purge of the Jews because a lot of those people were Jews. They weren't they weren't assassinated because they were Jews. They were assassinated because they they were um, uh, this internationalist communists. Now we were talking about uh, the the different periods of persecution, and uh, you were talking about some of the um, priests that you had uh, gotten to meet that that were in contact with some of these groups. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, um, uh, there were during the uh, you know. I, I, I became Orthodox in 1978 and uh, um, moved up to the Bay Area um, to UC Santa Cruz. So starting from that time, I got to know a lot of the clergy in the Bay Area, in the, especially in the OCA and also um, uh, to some degree in Rocor, but mostly in the OCA. And uh, even in San Diego, where my, I'm from originally, um, and uh, uh, as well as in, in the Bay Area, there were probably half a dozen Latvian priests, um, all of whom were, uh, at that time, they were in their 70s up. Um, so they would have been a, a right about the right age to have been clergy during the Second World War. And many of them had been involved in that, uh, 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 the, the Pskov mission. And, uh, I, we had a journal in our monastery called Divine Ascent, in which we did oral histories. Um, so it's, uh, there's some very interesting material there. Um, uh, another uh, old buddy of mine from, uh, from college, he's a, an Antiochian deacon, uh, John Dibbs, um, uh, had done a lot of that, uh, those interviews. And, um, it was a fast, you know, really fascinating. And some of these old guys had had quite some adventures. Any that you recall, anything that, that you can recall any stories? Well, I think one of the, one of the uh, most intense memories that I have, okay, this is like 35 years ago. <laughs> okay. Um, was uh, reading the, um, later on after I'd been to Russia in 1993, I lived in Russia um, most of 93 and part of 94. Um, I could really understand what, what it was like that they, would, that they described. It was like it had been written in the 40s, but it might as well have been written in the 90s of going into, into these towns where uh, the church had been completely desecrated and um, you know, boarded up or turned into other things, and um, and people were, uh, you know, lining up in hopes of getting some kind of uh, rations, and it and it, and just you know the abs the absolute poverty to which people had been reduced by uh, by communism, uh, and not just not just uh, the poverty of uh, uh, you know lack of money and lack of material goods, but but um, a spiritual poverty, a spiritual demoralization. Um, 
uh, which was, which in, indeed has taken years to overcome. Um, who are, who are some of the, is this, this is the catacomb period. Is this a, a period where there's some of those people that stand out as, uh, martyrs and catacomb saints? Well, there's certain, there certainly were catacomb saints. Um, uh, there certainly were, uh, people in the catacomb church in the, uh, pre world war II period. Um, uh, a lot of them came came forth and, and joined the church, or joined back with the institutional church. Uh, some of them did not. Um, uh, but by the time the 60s and the 70s rolled around, um, the catacomb movement was pretty much over to a great extent. Um, there were there were still many people that that kept their faith secret and uh, uh, and lived. Uh, uh, you know, they lived their faith, but very quietly um, while they, while they maintained big government jobs. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, and a couple of people that I, I only knew one person who was involved in the catacomb church. Um, and it was the, uh, 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 the mother of a, of a friend of mine. I, um, was at the marriage of her daughter and, and an American guy. And um, uh, she had uh, been raised in the catacomb church, which meant that um, uh, they kept the fast absolutely strictly. Uh, they would do hundreds of prostrations together as a family every night. Um, they, you know, very, very intense uh, uh, discipline. Um, uh, and piety. Of course, you know, she was pretty, felt pretty lost when, uh, uh, when she came to the United States because the church is not on that kind of level here. Um, but, uh, uh, you, but you found among the people who had gone through, um, not only the catacomb church, but many people who had gone through the gulags, um, this kind of intensity of faith and intensity of uh, spiritual life. I remember hearing some of the stories of, uh, as one of the elders of Romania, or it was, you know, people who had been, uh, you know, in prison for that whole time. And they said that that was the period when they felt the closest to God was, you know, when they were basically in jail. Yeah. Um, what, well, uh, go ahead. Well, that period actually is what produced many of the, many of the elders of the Russian church which was what, um, who provided the leadership and the, and the, well, the spiritual leadership, not so much institutional, but the spiritual leadership and the guidance uh, uh, to be able to, uh, for, for the church to be able to begin to blossom. You know, there's the ancient saying, the seed of the blood, the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. And so uh, Russia was well watered um and seated by the blood of the martyrs do you have any we hear a lot of different numbers do do we just not know or do you have any idea what the number was we hear you know millions of people during these these purges and these these decades do, you, do we have any a guess as to how many martyrs well they estimate they estimate that there were 20 million martyrs uh of uh of the russian orthodox church every um uh, men, women, children, lay people, monastics, clergy, uh, you name it. Um, on top of that, of course, there were uh, many who, uh, uh, who, were, who were murdered by the communists, um, who, uh, you know, all of the victims of the uh, uh, Holodomor in Ukraine, you know, the intentional famine that was perpetrated by Stalin um, and uh, uh, you know, which was like, I don't know, 12 or 15 million people, something like that. Um, and then all of, and then not to mention all of the people that perished um, in the invasion of Russia and, um, and, the, and the Second World War. So the 20th century was, was devastating for Russia um, uh, and for the population. Um, so it's been, a, uh, it's been quite a task for them um, to restore 
to restore not only the numbers of people, but also to uh, restore the, uh, um, uh, the morale of the population. Did you speak to this issue a, a lot of times, especially uh, people who come from the outside look in and, and they maybe have general ideas about the Cold War and they'll, they'll always bring up, oh, uh, there's all those KGB bishops. So all the bishops in the Russian church are all a bunch of KGB bishops that were, and sometimes even maybe ignorant Roman Catholics think that the people who left <laughs> the Soviet period uh, to come to the West, they're also all part of the KGB, right? Um, could you speak to how maybe it's not as black and white, it's more complex than that? I think Jim Jatris was saying the other night that um, during these different periods, the, the KGB kind of had layers or levels of like, you know, this bishop was cooperative, this bishop was maybe, and this bishop was not cooperative. So it wasn't all a black or white thing. Well, that's, that's absolutely the case. And the higher up a person was in the uh, administration of the church, the more, um, in, you know, especially in a place like Moscow, uh, the more likely they were uh, to have to succumb to some kind of uh, pressure from the KGB. Right. However, the KGB, you know, all you have to do is read the history of the CIA and realize that mm, there's the KGB had no monopoly on corruption um, and corrupting people and corrupting bishops, um, which is exactly what you're seeing right now in Ukraine. Exactly. Um, so, uh, uh, the KGB was, uh, you know, certainly did some horrific, horrific things. Um, uh, this new church in Moscow at Sretensky Monastery um, is built on the site of the uh, 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 Lubyanka prison and uh, was the killing ground. The monastery was the killing ground uh, for thousands and thousands of martyrs and those and the church is dedicated to the new martyrs who gave their lives on that, in that place. Um, about the military cathedral? No, I'm talking about oh, Stratton okay. Cathedral. Okay, the sorry. Church of, yeah, church of the Resurrection. Magnificent cathedral. Look it up on the internet. Um, uh, the, the, the government, um, forced the church to work with them on one level or another. Um, just like our government forces the church to work with it on one level or another. Um, look at all of this COVID stuff. Um, that's, uh, that's government, that's interference, government interference in the life of the church and the forced cooperation of the church uh, with the Soviets or with, well, no, with the American government. Um, Freudian stuff. Um, <laughs> the American Soviet government. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so uh, uh, there were there were bishops who sold out, sold out their people, um, and uh, that which is a, of course a, a, a horrific thing. But there were also many bishops who stood up for their people and who stood up to uh, to the Soviets to uh, uh, to make you know and. And sacrifice themselves and 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 their own liberty to uh, to be able to uh, uh, preserve the inte integrity of the church. Um, you know, I think one of the things I think is very uh, important is that you know it's easy for us to criticize people um, from the uh, from the safety and of uh, the freedom that we had in the United States. Um, it's an it's an entirely different thing uh, when you're when you're in the midst when you're essentially under house arrest um, and every move that you make is monitored. Um, how do you how do you protect your people with that? How do you make those decisions? Um, and so uh, I think the condemnation of the of those people. Uh, those, especially those bishops who had to make these horrific decisions is something um, uncalled for. Yeah, you can't make a snap. Black and white judgment. Yeah. What about um, 
one last question on the, the expatriates. Do, do we know how many people did leave during these periods? How many, um, I mean, in other words, how much of Rocor ended up being from the sort of initial people who left as opposed to missionary work, or is there not really any way to gauge it in, in terms of outside of Russia, the growth of the church during that, that period of the Cold War? Um, that is a good question. Um, uh, okay, the first, the first wave of people that, um, uh, and, and in fact, the creation of Rocor um, as an entity in 1922 um, was well before the Cold War, obviously, okay. uh, which starts after World War II. Um, and so that was a, there was a, a fairly large wave. I don't know how many people. Um, uh, but it was actually probably the first major wave of immigration of Russians uh, to the United States. Um, Alaska had very, there were very few Russian immigrants before that. Um, even the Russian church here, the, Rus the Russians provided the clergy, but uh, the Russian mission here, which, you know, from 1870 in San Francisco and onwards, um, the people were Greeks and Serbs primarily, and Arabs, uh, Syrians. Um, and it's only later that, and but, but there, there were Russian priests who were assigned. Um, uh, so the first major Russian immigration um, uh, was in 1922 um, from Europe. Um, then, then people trickled in uh, between the wars and after the, uh, uh, you know, because Europe of course was, was not exactly the most peaceful of, time, peaceful of places during the uh, years between, uh, during the 20s and 30s. Um, and then, of course, there was a, a huge immigration, uh, again, after the, uh, 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 after the Second World War. And in 1950, that was when, um, or thereabouts, when St. John of San Francisco uh, brought 50,000 uh, people into, into the United States. Um, ethnic Russians with, who had become stateless. Um, and so they mainly uh, spread out along the, uh, uh, the West Coast. And then, um, but there were also large communities in Canada, in Chile, um, and in Australia. Mm. You know, I read a really, I read a fascinating uh, piece, I'll get to this in a minute, about uh, the removal of Maximus V from a um, history blog that deals with Orthodox history, but um, during this, I want to ask you about that in a minute, but during this period uh, when the cold, the, the cold War starts to wind down to an end, we have the, the fall of the wall and all that, do you, what, what are the factors that, that lead us to the 2008 reconciliation? Um, had, had people been wanting this for a long time or was it just kind of waiting to see the winds of change, so to speak, and the fall of the wall and then maybe wait to see if, if things really had changed in Russia or um, could you speak to what led to that 2008 reunion? Um, <clears throat> well, there, it, for, well, ever since 1922, when the, you know, when the uh, Patriarch Tikhon had blessed the uh, external dioceses, to reorganize their life, it was always understood as a temporary situation. Provisional. Yeah, provisional situation until until normal relations could be reestablished. Um, and so uh, there was great doubt in the Rocor community um, that uh, uh, the, the, there could be um, normal relationship. Um, and basically, uh, the, the Moscow Patriarchate was undergoing a, a radical transformation. Um, and part of that was uh, uh, getting rid of all the old bishops um, and, and uh, who, had, who were either compromised or who had, had, had served under the old regime uh, the Soviet, in the Soviet period. Uh, and who, who were accustomed to doing things in that way, um, whereas and and 
and the whole life of the church was uh, was being rebuilt. Um, literally thousands and thousands of churches were being opened up, which meant, um, you know, some, uh, they had to uh, also uh, uh, supply personnel for those churches. And it, that didn't just mean one priest, you know, uh, for a large church, and many of these churches were very large, you would have to have four or five priests, you'd have to have some deacons, have to have choir directors, you'd have to have prosperous bakers, you'd have to have sacristans. And all of these people would be typically on salary on, on the staff of a, of a normal or normal sized urban church. Um, so it took, well, so now um, they've, they've built about 35,000 churches um, in the past 30 years. And so that means that they have to, they probably have to have 100 and 150,000 people to staff those churches. Um, that takes a long time to recruit and to, uh, to train all of those people. So, so they needed people um, who were inspired, people, young, younger people who uh, uh, were willing to give their lives to rebuild uh, the church and to, and to uh, teach and train others. Um, and so, uh, so the, the old guys basically went into retirement. Um, and uh, most of the, well, for example, Metropolitan Hilarion, um, uh, Alfeev, um, is 52. That means um, the, Soviet, the, uh, the Soviet power fell uh, over 30 years ago. Um, and so he was probably 20 when the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union uh, fell apart. Um, anybody, under th anybody under 40 probably doesn't remember being in the Soviet Union. Um, and so the great bulk of, uh, of the clergy and the faithful now of the church, they've, they've grown up in a free Russia. And, uh, and so the life of the church uh, reflects that freedom um, and, uh, and is there to support that freedom. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the fool, most foolish things that, that uh, journalists will say on TV is, oh, the Soviets are doing this and the Soviets are doing that. The Soviets disappeared 30 years ago, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, oh, they're still communists. Well, no, these are the people who suffered under, under the communists and are now, f and, and have been free for 30 years. Um, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of foolishness on the part of uh, um, our journalists. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They're, yeah, they're, they're pay basically paid propagandists and, and liars for the most part. In the mainstream, especially, um, I was re maybe to take it into the the more wider geopolitical sphere of, of where we are now. I was reading this, as I said, this essay from a uh, historian, ousting the ecumenical patriarch, the removal of Maximus V, according to the declassified CIA records. Of course, in the last several years, a lot of KGB and CIA archives have been sort of declassified, and made public from the Cold War period. And and what was fascinating about this was the parallels to where we are now with the ecumenical patriarch and the struggles with Moscow, it, it mirrors actually uh, the Cold War period in the late 40s when the West and Moscow were both uh, at that time um, really interested in swaying different patriarchates in their own sphere of influence. And uh, this article is just specifically about Maximus V, the predecessor to Athenagoras and how he, he was kind of- Sure. Somebody's at the door. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me pause it. I'm back. So in this, in this uh, uh, beginning of the Cold War period, the late 40s, when it kicks off, uh, the, the, you have the West really concerned about the existing patriarch at that time, Maximus V, and whether he'll kind of be in the sphere of uh, Moscow or will he be in the sphere of the West. And they talked about some of the skullduggery and that went on at that, that, that time. And the re only reason I bring that up is that it reminded me of how similar it is to now. Here we are, 2020. And we've got a very uh, seemingly similar type of situation. The difference being the roles seem to have reversed. The West has uh, less of a 
positive Christian attitude, seemingly from the perspective of the power structure. And the, the Russian, at least, attitude appears to be more uh, positive towards Christianity, especially in the moral sphere. Um, do you think that's accurate? Could you speak to that? Well, uh, Russia has returned to the, uh, uh, its, its self-identity, essentially, has returned to being the defender of Christianity, um, which is what it was up through the 19th century. Um, and into up to World War I. Um, uh, and so this is, for example, one of the things that we see in Syria. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, but it's also something that I think we're going to see a lot more of. Um, uh, well, it's, and the, you know, the Russians basically uh, uh, threatened Turkey to come to the defense of the Armenians, um, which is a Christian country being uh being attacked by by islam islam yeah um uh certainly russia has uh uh has adopted christianity um uh, wholesale um you can't I, there's there's of course still a, a necessity for individual conversions um but to a great extent most of the population has been baptized um, in the Orthodox Church, um, and uh, the and the, and the underlying social vision, the underlying idea—I hate to call it ideology—is um, uh, that of Orthodox Christianity. Right. Um, it's it's replacing communist ideology with Christianity, and uh, so this is the this is. Uh, this is the goal of Russia. It's, it's setting, and it, they realize that this is a multi-generational goal. It's gonna take 100 right. years to restore Christianity uh, to the place that it was uh, before Soviet uh, power. Um, but one of the things that uh, also I think is, is very interesting to such a great extent, Russia and the United States have um, uh, exchanged places. Um, uh, last time I was in uh, Russia, which was a few years ago, uh, and Clinton, or Clinton, um, uh, Obama was still president. Um, I had dinner with a, a historian. Um, he'd just written a big book on the history of the Roman Catholic Church in Russia. Um, and, and he asked me, why is your president working so hard to make America into a bad image of Russia in 1980? <laughs> the Soviet Union in 1980. Um, and if you ask Russians now, um, they're horrified at what's going on. Because all, all they see is a repetition of what happened there going on right now. So far, so far as they're concerned, we're in 1917. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, and it's the same actors, different individuals, same ideology. Um, so, uh, and, and what, is, what is the foundation of that ideology? To quote Solzhenitsyn, uh, men have forgotten God. Um, but I would also, I would go a step further than that. Uh, men have come to hate God. And that is, and that's the, that's the essence in the core of, uh, of communism. That's the essence in, in the core of socialism. Um, it's the substitution of the state for God. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a, uh, uh, and in that there's no salvation. Makes me think of the uh, excellent book by Father Seraphim Rose called Nihilism. I'm sure you, well, you're familiar, yep. familiar with it. And he traces out kind of the stages of revolutionary thought from the initial kind of uh, utopian idealism. And then it goes through these phases to where it turns into what he calls like a perfect nihilism, where it's just almost like destruction for the sake of destruction. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember reading about Lenin, I think, you know, saying that he used to write poems about he wanted, how he wanted to blow up the universe and all this kind of crazy stuff that he literally got to the point where he hated 
existence itself. He hated life. He hated all life. He hated existence. He wanted to see everything just destroyed. And I think Father Rose was saying that's kind of the end result of, of where this atheistic revolution progresses is not towards a utopia and, oh, we're all going to be flying around like Star Trek and it's going to be scientism ruling. It, it ends up in a much worse place. Right. It's, and it's even beyond demonic. It's satanic, actually. Exactly. Yeah. Satanic. Well, um, one last question and then, and then I'll let you go. Um, could you speak to, I know this is a really complex issue, but how would you introduce some sanity or um, cogent analysis to the situation with the present problem in the Ukraine, the EP, um, and the seeming kind of uh, changing of positions of some of the, the patriarchates. I know that some of them were more in the sphere of Moscow. It seems like pressure was exerted from uh, the U.S. and other people, and then they kind of flipped over to the other side. It's, it seems like people in the, amongst the Greek bishops kind of are split between the two, and monasteries are split down the middle. Uh, so how would you approach explaining this, if, you, if, if it could be done? Um, it's a very, it's a very complex issue. I, I, I can, you know, I understand, you know, the, you know, I, I, and, you know, what happened, I mean, is, you know, on, in, in, you know, just very clearly is, is that, um, uh, uh, for whatever reasons and however many dollars that was, um, uh, from the State Department, uh, uh, Bartholomew, uh, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew uh, invaded the territory of the of the Russian Orthodox Church and of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and uh, began uh, dealing with schismatics. Um, the invasion, the inva invasion of the territory of another church, um, is already a uh, a very severe canonical offense, right. um, and uh, and actually, any Orthodox bishop has to get express permission from the bishop of whatever place he's going into um, in order to even set foot in a church or do it or serve the liturgy. Otherwise, you're defrocked. <laughs> it's a defrockable offense. Um, Canonically, um, he not only that uh, he uh, not only invaded the territory. He sent exarchs, representatives essentially, to uh, to negotiate with the schismatic group. Um, the schismatics uh, had been um, anathematized, not not simply defrocked, but anathematized. And you have to be really bad to be anathematized. It you have to have really severely transgressed. Um, to get yourself cut off from the church. So, but he began to uh, uh, deal with these people, even though when, when they were anathematized, he explicitly and publicly affirmed the right of the Russian church, not only to do the anathema, but he affirmed the sentence. He confirmed. You know, he didn't have to confirm it. He affirmed it, saying that they did, they did the right thing. And they had full authority to do it. Um, so uh, that, was, uh, that was another problem, shall we say. Um, then, then he decides that uh, he's going to nullify the, uh, the granting of the Kievan uh, Metropolia to Moscow. Now, by doing that, what he's saying is that he is, going, he is seizing one third of the Russian Orthodox Church. Okay, and that's, that's, that's an, a thing that a lot of people aren't mentioning in this. Right. Uh, you, know, um, he's, you know, he sent letters to Metropolitan Anufri uh, saying that he's no longer a canonical bishop and he's no longer Metropolitan of Kiev and it's like, you know, and, and you know, and so, 
you know, and so, and then, and then granting autocephaly uh, to the, to this uh, schismatic organization. Um, there are two major issues there. One is that he uh, validated the ordinations of people who had no ordinate, no canonical ordination. Um, not by, uh, not by reordaining them canonically, you know, in a canonical way for, with canonical bishops, <coughs> but by the stroke of a pen, the Pope wouldn't dream of doing something like that. Unilateral. You, well, not only unilaterally, um, uh, the Orthodox Church and the Roman and the Roman Catholic Church take um, ordination of bishops extremely seriously. Right. Um, and there has to be actual um, ordination by a, can a canonical ordination to be able to accept a person as a bishop. So this is another problem. This is another issue. Then he grants them autocephaly uh, with no consent, with no uh, discussion with the Russian Orthodox Church. Here he's taking this group that's a schism from the Russian Orthodox Church that um, uh, where according to the normal rules of how, canonical rules of how things operate, um, the only people that uh, can reconcile a, a group that has broken off from it in schism is its mother church. They can't go around. <clears throat> And so, but with this, there is also an assertion of a kind of um, an almost universal jurisdiction. Um, so, so these are the these are the issues that are at hand. Now, there's another thing that is, uh, I think, very um, worthwhile to bring up, is that uh, Patriarch Bartholomew um, is an old man. Um, He's, he has uh, cancer. He's been on chemo for years. Chemo messes up your, your brain. Um, and, you know, who, do, who knows long, how, how long he has to live? Uh, I, you know, I, that's a perfect excuse for him to use. Well, I, you know, I was sick and I couldn't do this. And, you know, and so he could honorably get out of this whole thing and nobody would, you know, and everybody would excuse it. And, you know, um, but that's not happening. I've heard um, a couple of priests say to me, and, and I, I wasn't sure. I mean, to me, it seems like a spacious argument, but our, a couple of priests had said to me in passing, well, you, <clears throat> you know, that the, the, uh, ecumenical patriarch does have this authority to actually do all this from some canon from 500 years ago or something like that. To me, that seemed like a spacious argument, but have you, have you heard this claim that there's a, some ancient canon of Tomos of, of, from 500 years ago or something like this? No, it's more, it's more like 1500 years ago. Oh, it's that long. So oh what, yeah. The yeah it's the council of Chalcedon. Um, and <clears throat> It's a it's a uh, it's a debated canon which uh, uh, assigns him um, equal honor honor to Rome. Okay, so you're talking about Canon 28 with the 28, yeah. yeah. Well, I thought there was another one that somebody was saying from the 1600s that something about that if if uh, Constantinople granted uh, to Moscow the ability to have the jurisdiction in Ukraine, then they could take it back or something like this. I, I don't remember the full argument. It seems. Well, yeah, there is a there is a canonical rule about that. Okay, that's what it is. That's that, what I don't, I don't recall. Yeah, that once um, uh, once a church or a diocese or a territory is ceded from one by from one jurisdiction to another. Um, uh, the um, uh, it can no it can no longer be reclaimed by the previous jurisdiction um, after thirty years. Oh, okay. So that argument doesn't work now. 
Yeah, 300 years ago. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, um, so, I mean, there, you know, there's all sorts of stuff being made up. And, you know, and, and the real, I, and so far as I can see, what they're not dealing with is the actual canonical issues uh, that caused Moscow to break communion. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, which are the ones that I, that I just laid that out. You listed, right. Okay. Um, you know, because essentially they're trying to, they're, they're trying to justify it. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the eyes of, of, I would say probably most bishops of the Orthodox church, it can't be justified. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, this is a great discussion. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? And of course, I'll have a link below if anybody wants to support uh, Metwalt and Jonah at uh, uh, at his uh, PayPal page. There, you can donate. I'll have the link. Um, and then we did a previous discussion, or actually, Metwalt and Jonah did a couple nights ago about repentance and a kind of a call to repentance. So I'll have that linked as well as the uh, links to the Discord. And he does a weekly uh, catechism for the Discord. But anything else that you want to leave us with today? Well, I think we need to, uh, I think we all need to pray about this situation and, 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 and pray God that it will get resolved. Uh, because the way that it's going is, uh, it's leading to uh, a massive schism mm -hmm. um, uh, of the ecumenical patriarchate from the rest of, the, of world orthodoxy. And uh, that's, not a, that's not a pretty picture. Seems like that would be a pretty disastrous move too from a numbers perspective i mean isn't the church in the funar kind of a small <laughs> small church it's, i mean there's not a whole lot of people actually in turkey that are you know orthodox right well there's actually quite a few but um they don't necessarily go to church um and there's lots of russians and romanians and bulgarians under the in in, in istanbul even um but uh uh, I don't think they exactly populate the Greek churches. Um, so it's, it, it's very small. It's constantly in danger of being, of being uh, removed uh, from, uh, uh, from there. And so there's a possibility, I would say, that they're, they might even be looking at moving to the states, uh, which is the, by far the largest and richest diocese. Right, I guess um, that makes sense. And uh, so... Um, I think we, I think we really need to pray, uh, to pray for them, to, to pray for, certainly to pray for the health of Patriarch Bartholomew and, uh, to pray that, uh, uh, this, this entire, um, uh, fiasco will come to an end, uh, where, so that Orthodoxy is able to come back together again, um, and affirm its unity as opposed to, uh, split into um, uh, two opposing camps. Um, unfortunately, uh, the politics of it is that uh, the United States is way too involved uh, in manipulating the patriarch of Constantinople. Um, it's using it as a uh, geopolitical pawn um, in its uh, misguided uh, war against Russia. Um, and uh, uh, it's a very, very sad situation and nobody benefits. Of course, um, also the church is being corrupted because along with American money comes, uh, comes uh, American ideology, which is homosexuality and abortion and, um, and uh, anti-Russianism and all of this other and all of this other stuff, um, some of which is just profoundly uh, contrary to the uh, to the teaching of the gospel and to the canons of the church. Right. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Metropolitan and Jonah. Uh, it's been a great interview, and I always look forward to having discussions with you and everybody. If you would, be sure to like and share this video and subscribe below.